Welcome to another Liquid Bullet Productions. Uh, today I've got an absolute great guest, someone I've followed through, through my life, through my martial arts and upcoming teen years. Uh, movie star legend and martial artist, Lauren Avedon. Welcome. Thank you, my friend. Good to see you, Lee. Thanks for coming on. It's really appreciated. It's amazing to have you on the show. Awesome, buddy. I'm, I'm at your service. Fire away. <laughs> yeah, so so Lauren, you're obviously very well known for all your martial arts movies, uh, No Treat, No Surrenders, King of the Kickboxers, and also a great martial artist. But before we get into that, can I just roll you back to the beginning, a little bit of your sort of background of where you was born, where you was brought up? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, basically, I was, uh, I'm a child of a single mother, love child from the 60s, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, basically, my mom had me because she had met sort of the perfect man for her, right? She didn't want him, but she wanted something from him. So uh, I don't know how she did it, but here I am. So the fact of the matter is, is uh, what I learned from being in a single parent home and with a woman who was very advanced for her time. She was a creative director, an advertising executive, a producer of television commercials, director, had clients, international clients from all over the world and a lot of American companies. So I was exposed to all of these movie stars and all of these people at a very young age. And I sort of just inhabited the space. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't really care. You know, I was just learning. That's living in LA, right? In a certain way, back in the 60s, 70s and so forth. So. <clears throat> basically my mom had no designs on me ever following into, you know, acting or she didn't know what I was going to do. She was just happy I was around. And as I got older, I had tried, you know, the, so we say the corporate world, I had tried this, I had tried that. But when I walked into the dojo, when I walked into June Chung, this is after, just after I graduated from high school. So I'm about 17, yeah. almost 18. And there's a few chaps I knew that went to this martial arts school. And I really needed some direction. I'm now an adult. You know, I'm about to start college. And I need to learn how to be a man, really. So I walked into, I'd seen Bruce Lee and all that. I've always wanted to study martial arts. I was a, an exceptionally good athlete. Not so much in the, the normal sense like i wasn't good at track you know i would come in you know second to last or whatever but i was still developing in that age so walked into june Chung, saw this guy fly across you know the studio hit the heavy bag swing up and hit the ceiling well <clears throat> i was just like i want to know how to do that right i mean that's just amazing plus i knew some guys who's trained at that studio and they could hold themselves up against pretty much anybody right so i'd seen it physically at beverly hills high school fights and things like that right typical typical of any place where there are youngsters and testosterone or whatever so you know got into a great school lee i mean just like everything in life my mom was trying to design you know uh an experience for me right that was real she pushed me out the door and said find your way to school by the way when i was in london at nine you know she was like you, you know taught me how to trust myself set me free different time right didn't have to worry about your kids so much and yeah. oversee them and besides she wasn't having that she wanted me to develop my own self and independence and the way you do that is you shove them out in the world and let them and see what happens you know so she was worried because in those days they didn't know if you coddled as a male or whatever was he going to grow up and be so we say a bit different in personality right so she never coddled me <clears throat> and the fact of the matter is is what I learned from her is how to, you know, how to hold my own. But she couldn't teach me how to be a man. So when I walked into Jun Chung, I absolutely fell in love with it. Here's all of these guys that are like, they're walking around like lions. You know, they're just like amazing, you know, specimens of masculinity and of also badasses. So I just fell in love with it as far as the martial arts goes. And when I walked into the dojang, I felt like I was at home. I felt like I was in church. I felt like here I here I am, and, I, and I'm just going to be a sponge and soak it all up. And I did, and I excelled at that. And then opportunities came from that. I still studied. I you know uh, psychology, economics, 
you know, and then reality worked in, worked uh, what for what is now William Morris, but was triad artist, read scripts, thought I was going to be an agent, thought I was going to do this, thought I was going to do that. Anything but being in an office was what I realized. I don't want to be in an office all day under fluorescent lights. I got to figure out how to work this. So first the martial arts, then the acting just sort of happened because I was, you probably heard this and I've said this a bunch of times, but I was paying for my doctor bill. So we're all at this guy's house. And one of the guys there was an actor. And he said, you should come to my acting class. You'd be good. And I'm like, I don't know about all that stuff. And he said, seriously, you should come. So I did. And uh, I sat there in front of 12 people trying to read some words on a piece of paper, shaking like a leaf. And that bothered me. You know, that's, I was like, oh, I got to master this so I can stand in front of people and deliver a message or it'll help me in, right? In any situation, regardless if I, you know, stand in front of a camera and am told where to hit my mark and to say these words and to be believable. I thought it can only help me develop. And then time passes, trip to, uh, trip to Africa with my dad, come back. Phone rings at the Dojang, another phone call at the Dojang, right? I, that's how I got my SAG card. That's how I got to stunt. That's how I got all of these things was people calling the karate studio. Because what did you do in 1970, whatever, to find somebody who could yeah. also kick and punch and fall down, go boom, whatever, and do it with style and properly? Because the stuntmen at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, weren't really, really, weren't exactly so much into the martial arts as they were the stunts. So you could get a guy, a stunt guy who could absolutely fall down the stairs, crash that car, you know, do that fall or whatever, but he couldn't kick. So that's kind of how I got into it. I got that call from Roy Haran and I had been on the Junshung demo team. I had been all, you know, uh, Master Philip Rees, hop keto dummy with the cane. You know, I knew how to do reactions. I could act and so forth in these various situations. So I was, at that time I was, probably two and a half years into the Stanislavski Meisner technique acting class. And so it all just happened like it was supposed to happen. Phone call late at night at Jack, right out of the right out of a movie. <laughs> you know, so. And then I'm uh, I'm in Thailand and I'm working on my first film starring in the in the in No Retreat No Surrender 2, Raging Thunder. But even there we still didn't have the the job. We had to do a screen test. Matias and I out in the parking lot of the Ambassador Hotel in Bangkok. And in the mid midnight before, Yun Kuei had, you know, stopped me in the middle of the hallway there as I had arrived, just fresh off the boat, fresh off the plane, to do some reactions in the hallway. It's like, okay, so string test. Obviously, we know what happened. Uh, passed, passed with flying colors. So did Matias. And uh, hence the three-picture deal with Seasonal and those films that I'm so well known for. It's kind of hard to start, honestly, Lee with the best and then, you know, have to figure it out after your contract expires, you know, because here I am with the elite of action, really, <clears throat> at those days, in those times. I mean, Chuck Norris was great and all that stuff. <clears throat> Shokasugi was great, but now this is a new, this is a new thing. Um, Chinese action films being made in English for a Western market. So how wacky are these stories? How crazy are these setups? So that's how that's what happened. And uh, still, end of this April, I'll be going for a martial arts expo and whatnot. And people are still now three generations of fans want to see me, which is great. You know, that's a nice thing. Now I've been sort of, you know, in transition or here or there all of these years. Well, people don't know that I went back to stunting. They don't know about life, right? As it, as it pertains to film. You know, you have a certain shelf life and that shelf life's not over for me, but you're pigeonholed, you know? There's always the next guys. Now look at all these streaming companies and all of this film and all this content. So there's a lot of, of uh, it's totally different now. Yeah. Uh, for, for me personally, Lauren, I, I find the older style of the martial arts film so much more interesting than and realistic to nowadays because nowadays it's, I find that the martial artists in there are more like gymnast and it's for me being a martial artist and looking at watching a film it's so unrealistic to to land a somersault kick and stuff so for me personally and i know a lot of martial artists think the same as me i would much prefer to watch a more realistic fight than 
you know, gymnastics, acrobats going on? Well, we have uh, we, we have the benefit of actually understanding, you know, what it is. But the, the younger generation, you know, they're used to these, you know, video games and, you know, comic sort of action heroes. And, I mean, I think you can do it if it's done right. You know, I like the way, for example, my buddy JJ did Undisputed 3 with Jai White and with Boyko with Scott Adkins. You know, he used the camera to sort of slow things down because here's the problem with that karate demo action that you're seeing. There's not enough time for you to absorb a human, to absorb that and to take that moment and go, Ooh, you know, and, and see the reactions. So JJ did that by slowing stuff down and then speeding it up, and, right? Using the camera in a way that we could never do before. <clears throat> so there's certain films that are okay because I like seeing you, someone hit the ground. You know, I like seeing the actual, you can't CGI that well enough. You know, yeah. you know, when stuff starts to get dark, you're like, Oh, here comes the, here comes the drawing, you know, <laughs> but uh, no, I'm with you. I mean, it looks too much like a karate demo. That's what I say to so many young uh, choreographers, and, you know, people like that. I said, you know, this looks like too much of a give and take, man. There's got to be beats. There can't be just this perfect technique and all the stuff in the space. And you can see the pad, you can see the little bit of uh, whatever it is, pad or something on the ground for you to roll out on. And they're shooting and stuff in three weeks now. You know, I mean, it's crazy. I had three and a half months, for example. So right. there's a way you do it, though, right? Which accentuates whatever you're trying to get out of the fight scene. Over choreography for me, I just, I get lost. I sit there and I go, okay, karate demo. And then I check out mentally because I want to see the really hardcore ground pounding, heads banging, you know, somebody getting hurt, really. I mean, sorry, it sounds <laughs> terrible. But <clears throat> you have to put a little flesh and blood and sweat, you know, into that so that it looks like it hurts. If it's just people exchanging technique and then wiping their mouth and, you know, going huh, and doing it again, I'm not taken by that. You know, I'd rather watch the one good shot of really low of this guy getting sw swept and doing it, you know, a flip and a dead man, you know, because now I can see him. I see the ground I'm like, oh, yeah, let's see this. Blam. You know, OK, that made the whole fight. Now, what about the rest of it? I don't know. You can leave it on the floor. <laughs> It's for <laughs> the cutting room floor. So I'm with you, totally with you. And that's something I'm hoping we can bring back. You know, Keith and I, Vitaly, we're, we're trying to put something together. We're trying to do this. We're trying to do that. Yeah, I think it's definitely missing in the, in the industry now, that sort of uh, I agree. Sort of stuff. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. And there's people that are still kind of doing it, but it gets lost in this whole style and flavor. Oh, we got it. We're going to do the it. We're going to do it, man, for the 40th time. You know? Yeah. Okay. So it is what it is. Um, I think somebody asked me a question last week or week before. If Ip Man, the, the first No Treat, No Surrender, the influence was Bruce Lee's ghost. So somebody asked me, um, would it be far-fetched if Ip Man came back and was the ghost for this current or our new No Retreat, No Surrender, and Donnie Yen played Ip Man? And I thought, well, as long as it's not too corny. You know, because what's happened with it, man, is all of a sudden he's become this Chinese legend. When you know, in truth, yes, he had some, you know, uh, shall we say role, but he was actually a very humble, you know, little man. And they've blown him up into this giant of Chinese culture. You know? So, okay. So that's how legends are made, right? But I would love to see a resurgence of the more ground pounding, ass kicking, sweat, you know, People are limping around, and you know it's really hardcore, and you know it. I, I just I love that. So I don't know how you get that back into people's heads that are making these films, the youngsters. That um, you know it's got to it's got to look like you you got to believe it, and the only way to believe it really is you've got to shoot it right, not be so tight, stop with the wiggly crap, get off the gyros, and set it on some sticks. Put it wide, do this, do that, and let there be a rhythm, you know, to it. So there isn't that. That's what that's what's missing, in my humble opinion. Would you agree? Yeah, hundred percent, definitely. 
Yeah, he's just lost that lost that finesse about, it, hasn't it? Lost this yes. sort of culture yes. of it's, fighting. It's lost that rhythm and that ability for you to really get into the moment and watch these guys, you know, trying to figure it out. Yeah, I think as well, it's, it's taken the sort of shine off the martial arts where it's become more gymnastics. It's sort of taken yeah, the away trickster, the trickster the, king. I get yeah. you. I get you. Yeah. But, you know, that's a phase. That's a fad. That's a thing. It can be done, but it should be an accentuation of, you know, some. It's like if you look at King of the Kickboxers, it's not trickstering, but it's a series of techniques that Billy uses to, you know, basically take out any opponent. And that, that part of the story, they actually had to fly me back to Hong Kong so I could sit there and block these styrofoam logs, you know, <laughs> to show that uh, they literally forgot to shoot that. So. They so that I could do that silly stuff, but it ties things in. You know, it makes it makes the the audience want to see more, and uh, all of that build up to the crescendo of the two of us. And that I mean, when you look at Billy's legs and when he's kicking, and you see that there's no mini tramp, there's no wires. That's dude jumping. You know, it was insane. So that kind of athleticism too is missing. Really? Yeah. Uh, when, you, when, when you have so many great athletes, but you've only you've always got, shall we say, the standouts, like a Scott Adkins, like a Billy Blanks, like I could play off of that. They made me better, for example, Keith Cook and Billy, um, and all of these people that I worked with. To me, that, that was one of my my favorite films as a youngster, King of the Kickboxers. That was the one that got taken off the shelf every day and played. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, brilliant film. <laughs> well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's pure entertainment. You know that, pure entertainment. So. Yeah. Can I just ask, um, Lauren, so when, when you're um, fighting in them fights, obviously the Chinese films seem to be a lot more hardcore than the sort of uh, the Western-made films. Yeah. Was there sort of, um, I've seen like interviews with Jackie Chan and stuff. How were the injuries on there? Was there sort of many injuries happening and stuff? Oh, yeah. And, you know, you always cover your ass, right? So, like, in the end, and I've said this before, there's a real punji sticks in those water, in the water underneath Billy. And okay. So, yeah, there was, they had real sharpened bamboo sticks. I've got some of the documentary footage I'm going to be going through, so hopefully put that together, too, the behind the scenes. But, yeah, so I said, could you please replace those? Because I don't know about you, but I could slip off of here. You could slip off of one of these platforms, fall in the water, and, you know, Become a popsicle. I mean, to be fair, this sort of day and age nowadays is health and safety crazy, isn't it? You, yeah, they, I mean, there's no you know, need for doing that, that now, but them there's days. No need for, there's no need for that. So, can you put her up there and this and that? And then when we're fighting and we're doing our thing, basically, yeah, I mean, you're sore, you're injured, you're in pain. Uh, Billy is amazing because he's doing it, you know, with no pads. He's, he's not able to pad up. To, to take hits and to do this and do that. Whereas I kept my, you know, top on. How am I going to take my top off against Billy Blanks? I mean, that would really be, that would almost be a joke fight, you know. Oh, here's Noodle Boy over here. Here's, you know, <laughs> the thin guy, you know. Yeah. So so it's technique, isn't it? It's the beauty of our technique. We've both got long legs. They couldn't undercrank, you know, the, how they loved to shoot 22 in those days, you know, to make things clean and fast. They couldn't do that with us a lot. They had to go the opposite way. We were so fast that they couldn't undercrank. And uh, so that was kind of cool. So when you see a lot of the stuff that slowed down, yeah, there's a method to that madness. But most of the stuff, yes, yeah, some of it's shot at 22, but oh, some of it they couldn't. Because it wouldn't match, you know. All of a sudden, you got. We're so fast already; it becomes like okay. Again, the audience needs to absorb what they're seeing. So there needs to be beats. There needs to be some acting. I need to, you know, he needs to go ah like this before he comes into me to give me a second, you know. All of this stuff has there's there's a mindset about that. There's a method about that to set up the next right round or the next what's what's going to happen next if it all kind of continues in a like a machine gun you're just going you know at the same time you can't really take all that in so beats bits acting you know try to stand up you know and deliver some dialogue 
Yeah. So it becomes it becomes a from dawn until the sun goes down. You know, a, a, an amazing effort, an amazing orchestration, really. And uh, that was it was hard, dude. It was hot. They're burning the smoke powder that probably I should be getting some sort of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma diagnosis later on in life. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah, I mean, it's crazy <clears throat> what we went through and carried on to do so. And if you notice Billy in that film, he comes out the first time you see him there waiting for me. You know, he's about yeah. to put Bruce uh, Fontaine in the, in the jaw there. And you see he's just massive. Yeah. So that's the first thing they shot. And then you see the end of the film, and he's leaned down quite a bit, but to his favor, you know, because he still looks massive. And actually, he can jump higher now, you know, without that extra 25, 30 pounds. And uh, we had, like, he, he was so great to work with. He came to me in a, early in the movie and said, you know, Lauren, this is your movie. I want it to be great. I'm going to do everything I can. And I'm like, really, I'm so grateful to you because, you know, we got, we're, we're a team. You know, we got to do this together. And I can't be constantly afraid that you're going to take my head off. And I know you could. Because if you notice him, he comes so close to me. Yeah. He comes so close. And I we trusted each other, you know, not to affect a, a really powerful hit. Now, he's selling the crap out of it, too. And one time I did stick him good in that, you know, tete-a-tete. Uh, we both do the front kick and I push him back a little bit. Well, the only way that he could go back is if I executed that. So I put put more towards his center of gravity. He was like, hey, man, that was a good kick. You know, so we're both working off of each other. The more I get hurt, the better you look. The more you get hurt, the better I look kind of thing. And we're, we're feigning it, but it's not too hard, you know, when it's 110 degrees outside with 99% humidity. And the sun is baking you, you know, it's just not that hard. You know, you can really get it. Use the moment, you know, get into it. And she was just phenomenal to work with. I mean, the dude was just uncannily incredible and uh, an amazing athlete. So with Keith Cook. So, so long. can I just ask you this? So yeah. How did you find the transition from martial arts to actually screen working where you're not actually hitting people? You're hitting people a lot, believe it or not, but not to the face, usually, not to the head, and sometimes to the head. But, you know, it's all control. Well, the thing about it is, as you know, as a fighter, you don't show, you know, you don't you don't telegraph. You don't wind up. You don't, right? You don't show what you're going to do. You sneak in and you use the line of the body and you hit your opponent or you knock your opponent out, or you set up your opponent with combinations, or you do whatever, and you execute. You know, So when you're in a film, the thing that's, that's so important about martial arts is, is the technique. Obviously, well, he was a seven-time world karate champion. I was, I think, a second-degree, no, not quite a second-degree black belt there. So I'm still learning, but technique is like my world. All day I'm teaching technique before in the dojo. All day I'm executing technique and I'm teaching people the lines. You know, I'm teaching people this is how you kick and people don't see it or you're not moving or whatever. So I take that and then you add the reaction. So that hence the demo team, this and that. So martial arts is all about that because if you notice in Kung Fu styles or when they're doing exhibition, you know, there are these very, especially Chinese, uh, when they do their demos with the, the spear or whatever. You see these guys whipping their heads around, and you know that spear is coming awfully close, right? So that's how you get to you transition is you're doing basically a demo, but under these realistic circumstances, and you've got to spit blood, you've got to spit water, you've got to accentuate it. So that becomes the craft. And then we didn't have playback, so we're not sitting there watching what we did before. No, we're just carrying on, and the guys who are looking are going, no, 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 we got to do that again. And you're just doing that all day. So every once in a while, you got to go, okay, where, where am I? You know, what are we doing now? You kind of thing. And, uh, you know, but you have to get into that, into that rhythm and flow. And you just are, all, you're, that's why you're there. Because you're a great athlete. You can adjust and you can come 
you know, that close and not hit somebody, right? But have them take that same end of the wit and, and give the reaction to it, right? So it's an art. And then at the end of the day, yeah, you, you've kicked the crap out of each other. You know, I mean, I went through so much Da Jiao and Dr. Wong's oil and hot baths, Epsom salts, whatever else. Come on. You know, here I am, a bean pole in the middle of the jungle. So, you know, I got sick. I got this. I got, well, nobody's going to know that except you. You got to come off permanently forever and ever as this guy, you know? So put that all aside. That's part of the acting bit, isn't it? And it doesn't matter how you feel. It matters how you feel in the moment that the camera's rolling, you know? So that's the discipline. And that's part of martial arts too, isn't it? Is you've yeah, got to, right. You've got to control your emotions, your this, your that, and focus. And so having done that for so many years, it's just it was kind of like uh, walking. You, know, you just do it. Yeah, and like a night shot book right into you. Yeah, exactly. It becomes like second nature. And then when you're dealing with these high level athletes, you know, you know, you, you've got to trust them and they've got to trust you because it's give and take. And it's all there's all, you know, a choreographed sequence. And, you know, you've got to know that if somebody was just to digress, digress from Billy for a minute. But, you know, there's a lot of Thai guys that didn't know really the choreography and couldn't really be shown. And they're not. So sometimes I'd have to hit them. You know, yeah. and and the, the the Chinese would say, just hit him, just hit him, just hit him, because he's not giving a reaction. And I'd say, okay, fine, you know, and uh, and then I would apologize and say, I'm sorry, and they didn't care. The Thais didn't care. So there's a different also thing you can get away with in Asia, honestly, yeah. that you can't in the Western set, like you can't in a, in Hollywood, for example, you can't fire a blank weapon. Don't get me started on Alec Baldwin or all this stuff, but. You can't fire a blank weapon in the same shot as as the uh, person who would be receiving the hit, right? You can fudge it. There's all sorts of ways to do it, but in Asia, you can do whatever you want. You, know, you, you just you better cover your butt because <laughs> you better ask that armor. Is that a full load that's going to be fired at my face? Okay, so can you have him point because camera can't tell where he, whether he's pointing like this or like this if it's right at me. Can you please have him. What's the best angle, you know? And I'm gonna, I'll be over here, because I've had a crimp from a blank hit me under my eye. Okay. Yeah. If it hit me in the eye, I lost the eye. Blind me. Yeah. So the thing about it is, is that's what's going to happen. That was Wanda Acuna, actually. She shot this snub nose 38 out at the airport, no retreat three. Nobody told her, don't point it right at me. Funk, you know. And I'm feeling this thing running down my face so after we cut i'm like what's going on it feels i'm like oh it's a little blood what is that so they took me aside and the medic dug out a little piece of brass and they you know patted it up and covered it up with makeup and i carry on i mean we're doing a fight scene so there's not there's not too much say you know that hasn't been beaten up or scratched up but yeah i could have lost my eye that day Blimey. so you're gonna have dangerous it can be yeah it's very it's incredible uh Ten most one of the ten most dangerous places you can be in the world is on a, a movie set, and that goes with like diffusing bombs, being on an oil, you know, being a, a roughneck out in the you know Arabian Peninsula, uh, whatever. Think about it. You know, the top ten most dangerous places you can be is on a set. That's crazy. So it is what it is, brother. You know, yeah. I mean, you adapt. You adapt. <laughs> you know, obviously, you're supposed to be there. So you, that helps you. you. You develop your confidence. You start to be synergistic. You start to become a part of the sort of the organism, you know, and you kind of know what's going on eventually. But the more you relax, rightly, the more you relax and you accept the moment, you get into the moment, and whatever. You know, what happens is, is ego's your enemy, anger's your enemy, frustration's your enemy. You're miserable anyway. Accept it. You know, accept it. And be in the moment so when they roll and take your moments to rest, you know, that kind of thing. It's just a, it's a discipline. It's all discipline, isn't it? Lee? Yeah. So without without the martial arts, you don't have as much, I guess, experience in being miserable, for lack of a better word. <laughs> <laughs> you understand me though. You just yeah. sort of get into it. You're 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 on a mission 
all together a team working for the same goal. So you inspire others and they inspire you. Like I was always walking around talking to everybody, all the crew, all the, you know, the extras, whatever, you know, if I had the time and I would acknowledge them, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here. Thank you for doing whatever. And uh, because we're all people at the end of the day and that's that. So it's amazing the camaraderie and the, and the things that you can get done under very extreme and extraordinary circumstances. So very lucky, very lucky yeah. to have had those experiences. With. No, I'll just jump in there while you're talking about what you, you acknowledge the extras and the others, etc. I think that's a really great actually to have. I've, I've done a couple of film sets, been on little bits myself, and some of the main actors are just so rude and arrogant. It's, it's unbelievable. But uh, it's great to hear that you actually put yourself out and give time to people. It's well, great. yeah. I mean, we're all there, you know, and we're all in the same boat. So, and I think that's just part of my rent being raised uh, properly, honestly. And prima donnas, they last about as long as prima donnas do. Nobody wants to work with people like that. Yeah. There's somebody waiting at the door, you know, to replace you. So, yeah, I think it's especially rude as well when you see them like, you know, the kids that are fans of theirs and they wait for hours to see them uh, to get a. Uh, autograph and they blank them and stuff it's uh I don't know, just not very not very nice is it no it isn't and i had an experience with and i won't say the person's name or let's just say he's in the rap industry but i saw him on a set and i had a chance to do a stunt stunt in this video like i was with Joni's stunt service this is a long story but you have these answering services when you're a stunt person and they sort of designate your level in the biz you know it's interesting so I was with Joni's and you know, looking for a guy to just come on to this gentleman's set and do a quick gaff um, and get 500 bucks. Well, I had seen this gentleman, I hesitate to call him a gentleman, but have a fan come up. And this was on a set somewhere in downtown LA. I just happened to be visiting another stuntman about, you know, something. Cause that's how you used to get work. You'd hustle, you go out during lunches, you introduce yourself to the coordinator. You do this, you do that. And then, you know, a lot of people knew who I was anyway. So it's okay. But uh, this guy insulted this woman. And she was like, oh, you, I love you so, so, so. He's my baby. And then he said, oh, that's one ugly-ass baby. You know? And I was like, is that really necessary? You know? And so I saw him behave that way. And, I, and then they were saying, Lauren, you know, why don't you go do this? You know, you pick up 500 bucks. I said, I'm going to pass. Yeah. Because of the attitude. Yeah. And, no, you know, crazy. I just didn't need to, I didn't need the money that bad. And then I don't want to be around that kind of attitude or that kind of behavior or that kind of person. Yeah. So, I mean, even as a stuntman, I had a choice to say no. So I did, but you, you want to be around people that, you know, you respect and you work with. It's a job. You know, you work, I work with so many stars and so many people behind the scenes in, in television and Hollywood and all over the world. And you just, you know, you get to, Get to know people, and you're doing a job. I went back to stunting because it's the only way I could make twelve hundred dollars a day and still show up and, you know, pick my kid up from school, for example. What were you doing after the sort of films? You just yes, yes, yes. I went back to stunting. I, you know, went went through uh, you know life changes, and uh, I was broke. So you know, the thing about it is, is I, you know, people had been asking me. Or why don't you come to Buffy and you know, why don't you come to the, on the set? Why don't you why don't you do this? Why don't you do this? And I was like, you know, because you, once you're in, you're in. You know, you got to kind of make that switch. And then the real stunt guys, they don't respect actors at all. <laughs> Sorry, but you know, they don't want an actor stunting. They want a stuntman stunting, right? So anyway, so I broke through those barriers because I would just sell out. You know, anyway, so the word got around. Well, he knows camera. He knows this. He knows that. He's humble. Okay, hire him. And so I started being able to go back in and work and, you know, do this and do that. And, people, you know, I'd show up to set or whatever to hustle. And they'd be like, what are you doing here? And I'd say, I need a job, you know. So that's it. That's part of the humility of martial arts, too. Look how I was able to go back to the, to the root and start to work. And these people who really supported me. So all I can tell you is stunt department and people in the industry – that are on the other side of the camera, they, you know, like to work with people who know what's going on. And that's that, you know, so I, I'm so fortunate, really. 
to be able to have that reputation and knowledge and um, come in and play with the big boys. Really, it's just TV, but that's okay. I can go home now. I don't have to go back and live out of a suitcase. I can go home and uh, pick my daughter up from school later. So there it is. So that's that. You know, we make our choices. We go back to the to the root. And that's what martial arts allows you to do, doesn't it? Because I'll always train. I will always go back to the basics because what am I really doing as a martial artist? I'm working on myself. I, I got into it to learn how to fight and to carry myself as a man and, and to, you know, be, I don't know, the warrior. Yeah. Because all of my family come from warrior, that warrior class. I'm the first in six generations not to put on a uniform and go in the war, in the battle. And that was just because of my mom. My dad was in the Navy. My grandfather was First Army Air Corps. Her former husband, my mother, uh, was married during World War II. And her guy was an LST driver, right? uh, an LCI driver, landing craft infantry, landing, you know, uh, support, transport. So one of those things that drops the thing down, you know, like you see in uh, uh, Saving Private Ryan or you see in D-Day or whatever, you know, Tom Hanks, come on, right? Boom, it comes down. That's what he was driving, and it got blown in half. So she got the telegram. So I'm like, Mom, I want to go in the Navy. She's like, no, you know what I've been through with Granddad? Because he was gassed in World War One, had terrible ticks his whole life, and then with her husband. Now, now I'm going to let my boy go into the Navy. I thought my dad had been in the Navy. You know, I don't have any money for college. I don't have any money for blah, blah, blah. Well, that was, I'm glad I didn't go in. I mean, I would have never gotten these movies, right? But it was also her. She couldn't emotionally, right, handle the fact that her son was going to be in uniform. So my uniform was martial arts. My uniform was, was the Dobok. And my warrior journey was with people. And uh, with those, those people that, were interested in perfecting their their style, perfecting their their way as a human, and uh, that's what I found at Junshan. And you know, I found these great philosophers in Philip Ree and Simon Ree, and, and um, these great people. Them, them guys you just mentioned there, Philip and Simon, they're the guys from the film Best of the Best, don't they? Correct. And I was supposed to play Chris's part in that, but um, oh, really, I couldn't have Chris Penn. I couldn't have because that would have. Uh, negated me from doing any of the rest of the way. my contract was seasonal. Oh, I didn't God. have an exclusive with him, with them, but I knew that if I did anything else, they weren't going to use me as their star. So oh, I knew God. that. So I kind of sort of bowed out of that, and whatever. And actually it's a blessing because if you notice that film, the only real martial artist in that film was Philip and Simon. Yeah. Yeah, you can tell, can't you? <laughs> yes, I really can. And I love them. They are my, they are, uh, yeah, the reason for me being who I am today and Master Chung. And then all of the greats that I met on the, on the journey afterwards, you know, after I left Jun Chung and an entire journey. I mean, for for almost 10 years, I was going with one of the head of the Kuki Wan around. As, it was also, a, he was also part of the WTF, World Techno Federation, but he was, sanctioning all tournaments and events in Central and South America. So I got my international. I kept going back into the martial arts, Eagles team, demo team, uh, going going overseas to this tournament, to this Pan Am, to this international championships, to this world championships as part of the cookie one. Now we see how Olympic Taekwondo has evolved. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I don't like this whatever math they've got with an octagon on it. And you got to grab each other now and try to, you know, hit, hit grab the hogu and hit each other with your foot. I mean, it's, it's freaking lame compared to the eighties and nineties Olympic technical, no trembling shock, wide open space, all of this dynamic kicking technique. That's the beauty of Taekwondo, right? The footwork and the kicks, because it's far too easy to punch somebody in the face. But if you can kick somebody in the face with style and knock them out, isn't that something beautiful to see? And then these guys and they're, they're spinning, whizzing, you know, technique that's effective. Now you've got them coming together, grabbing each other and trying to hit each other with little inside crescent kicks or if one's falling down and he flips a kick up and kicks the other. I mean, yeah. sorry. It's totally it's down over the years, isn't it? It's totally gone to, 
But I was around during the heyday 